Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Christian Apologist Podcast. So glad you could join us. I hope you all had a very, very Merry Christmas. Today's episode, we are going to talk about Christianity on why Jesus is the true Lord. Why should we be following Jesus? Out of all the gods people claim, which God is? is actually the true God. Why is the Christian God the only one that is true? There are many, many religions and gods that people believe in and put their faith into. The three major world religion views are theism, which means God made all, pantheism, which is God is all, and atheism, which there's no God at all. We don't have time to get into all these religions. Why? Because it would take many many college semesters to cover them all in detail. The majority of people agree that there are three main theistic religions who point to only one God as the creator of the universe and all that is in it. Now, having only one God is what was known as theism. There are three of these theistic religions, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. So which religion is the right religion? Well, To make it plain and simple, Christianity is true. The Bible says so. Good night. That is the simple and shortest answer I can give you. The long version is, well, we're just going to have to dig into the proof and the evidence that leads to Christianity being the true religion and Jesus Christ being who he says he was. So let's look into this evidence together. As mentioned earlier on our other episodes, we have to believe that Jesus of Nazareth was God the Son of God, before we can believe in Jesus of Nazareth being God, the Son of God. You have to believe that before you can believe in. Now, can all religions be true? Absolutely not. Why? Because the laws of logic have already shown us that something can't be true and false at the exact same time. So if one religion is true, then the others are completely false. They all can't be true. So What is Christianity exactly? Christianity is the belief of one God in whom we get Jesus of Nazareth being God, the Son of God in human flesh who came to earth, lived a perfect, free of sin life, was crucified on the cross for our sins. He rose to life after three days and he is now at the right hand of God in heaven and it's only through him we have forgiveness of our sins and eternal life in heaven. If you want to know more about Christianity, Guys, there's a book out there. It's called The Holy Bible. It's been around for a very, very long time. I suggest picking it up and reading it. But how do we know that Jesus is the truth? Well, let us first look at the Bible, uh, who the Bible claims Jesus is. John 10, verse 30 says, The Father and I are one. Philippians 2, verse 5 and 6, You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Through he was God. He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Verse John, 17, verse 21. As the Father is in me, I in him, they also may be one in us. In John, chapter 1, verse 18. No one has seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Bible makes it very clear in many places, like I have just pointed out and many more, that Jesus is God, the Son of God. But how do we know that's true? We first need to look at the eyewitness testimonies. Let's start with the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, could the Gospel writers have been lying? Yes, but that wouldn't be logical. Why? Because all the gospel writers were already Jews except for Luke, and Luke was a doctor. Jews already had the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and they believed they were saved without Jesus. So why would they give eyewitness details about the life and death of Jesus if they already believed they were saved? What Jesus claimed was considered blasphemy according to the Jews. Matthew, Mark, and John were going against everything they believed in and have been taught from birth. But why would they do this? They believed in Jesus being God, the Son of God, so much that they were willing to and did die for their belief in him. Now, you might say people lie all the time. People write books and give interviews in which they know they're lying. And that's true. 
but people usually know when they are lying and nobody who's lying is willing to die for that lie in which they know they're lying about. So all, so, uh, all four gospels were written at different times. The book of Mark was written around AD 66 through 70, Matthew and Luke AD 85 through 90 and John AD 90 through 110. It's not as if, you know, all these guys were just sitting around a campfire and discussing what to say and what not to say. They weren't like, hey, Mark, how about we say that Jesus called Peter Satan? What do you think about that? You know what I mean? I mean, that just doesn't make sense. That is ridiculous. Okay, but, you know, another thing that a lot of people want to say is that all the books were written years after when they had claimed the actual events of Jesus occurred. Is this true? Absolutely, that's true. But so were almost all history books, and we believe them to be true. Why should the account of the New Testament books be considered less than any other history book, period? All four books claim the life of Jesus was anything but less than extraordinary. They all speak of his miracles, his life, his death, and his resurrection. After the resurrection of Jesus, over 500 people witnessed seeing him, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. You know, in the United States court system, it only takes two witnesses to convict someone to prison. And we're completely okay with only two witnesses to convict someone to prison and even possibly to death row, yet we struggle to believe the eyewitness account of over 500 people? Why? Because many see the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' resurrection as unreliable due to how long ago it was, and they never personally saw Jesus and all he had done, so they can't just account it to be true. And if that's going to be the logic we're going to use, then I guess we can't say for absolute certainty that Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, or John Adams ever lived. Nobody today saw them, met them, or knew any of these men personally. All we have to go on are history books and their legacies, and we accept all of them as being true and accurate. You know, Paul of Tarsus, who was previously known as Saul, wrote many accounts of Jesus. Paul was a Jew, just like the other three Gospels of the writers. And Paul was actually one of the most feared Jewish men by the Christian community. Why? Because he was a Roman soldier who was in charge of killing all those that were followers of Jesus. He was a murderer of Christians. Paul thought what he was doing by killing all the Christians was the work of God. Paul had no reason to make up a story about his conversion. In his eyes, he was already saved. Heck, if anything, he probably figured he would be at the right hand of God because of all the good works he was doing for him by killing these Christians. He didn't think he needed Jesus to be saved. But you know, Jesus came to Paul on the road to Damascus, and Paul believed in him. After his conversion, Paul went on to become one of the most prolific authors of the New Testament. He is actually attributed to writing somewhere between 13 to 14 books out of the 27 books of the New Testament. Now, why would Paul, a Jewish soldier and a hater of Jesus Christ, make claims against his own beliefs and ultimately die because of his assurance in Jesus as the Lord of Lords? Why would he do that? It doesn't make any sense that he and the others would have recanted their, I mean, it would have made more sense for them to have recanted their claims before being killed, but they didn't. They all died claiming that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and the Lord of Lords. Now, what did they have to gain by lying? Absolutely nothing. Why is that? Because when they wrote the Gospels and when Paul wrote his books, they never gained success, money, popularity, or fame. In fact, it was just the exact opposite that actually happened. They were repeatedly thrown into prisons, beaten, and eventually murdered for their own beliefs. For someone to have gone through all that after already believing they were saved without Jesus could only mean one thing, and that would be what they had witnessed, what they had seen, and what they believed was the absolute truth. Doesn't the Old Testament and the New Testament have contradictions, though? That's what a lot of people say. But don't contradictions prove its fallacy? 
No. Why? What many see as contradictions are actually just known errors. So am I saying that the Bible has errors? Yes, it does. Why? Because we can see the few errors in the Bible by comparing the many manuscripts to one another. And in, in virtually almost all cases of known errors, scribes were able to recognize these errors and correct them. So the Bible having errors does not disprove it to be true. Why? Because the Bible having errors doesn't prevent us from knowing what the main topic being expressed was. For example, if I say John, we're going to talk about John chapter 10, verse 30. If I was to say, I and the Father are one, but I misspelled Father with the F-A-T-H-U-R. And yet in manuscript two, it, the exact same scripture says, I and the Father are one, but instead it's spelt F-A-T. C-H-E-R, or like in manuscript number three, if I say I and the Father are one, and in this manuscript, it's F-A-C-T-H-E-R. Now, if you look at those three manuscripts, are you going to be able to conclude what the Bible was saying? Of course you can. The total number of actual Greek manuscripts of the New Testament stacked over a mile high. That's huge, considering most Greek classic literature manuscripts barely made it to four feet high. So why didn't God just preserve the original? Wouldn't that have just been simpler? No, because let us assume God did preserve the original manuscript. What could we do with that original manuscript? What could we have done with it? We could have altered it, changed it. We could have even destroyed it altogether, and nobody would know the difference. But what God did was had over 400 copies of the original made and passed out to different people. Now, why would he pass them out to different people? Because if someone would have changed any one of their copies, we would know who changed their copy and people could call them out on it. So simply put, by God not preserving the original manuscript, he actually preserved the original. Make sense? But what if the errors aren't as subtle as the ones like I had mentioned, right? What about the gospel's accounts of the resurrection of Jesus? I mean, some say one angel was present at the tomb and other two angels. And uh, others say, uh, you know, who showed up to the tomb first? So which gospel account is correct? Honestly, I believe all of them correct. Now, how's that? Because every book was written from that person's own personal experience and viewpoint. I mean, let's just say, for example, four people see a crime and the police show up to take down their eyewitness reports. Now, you will hear four different stories of how the crime happened. That happens every time. One witness will say they saw only one male suspect. Another will say they saw two male suspects. Another will say they saw one male and one female. And the fourth witness will say we saw only one female. So are any of them actually lying? No, absolutely not. They all saw things from their different perspectives, but through their testimony, we are able to combine them and get an accurate account of how the crime happened and what happened. It is because of these types of errors that I truly believe gives more validation to the stories and the accounts of Jesus of Nazareth. Because if every single eyewitness gave the exact same description and details of what happened, it would look as if they had gotten together and schemed the whole story up, and none of their testimonies to me would even be close to being valid. But let us use a true, more famous example. One of the most tragic events to occur in modern U.S. history was the 9-11 attacks in New York City. Did y'all know that some of the eyewitness accounts say that an explosion occurred before either of the planes hit? Other witnesses say it was a commercial plane, while others say it didn't look like a commercial plane. Does having several different contradicting eyewitness testimonies mean that we can't put together what happened during the 9-11 attacks? Of course not. We know the main point of the event. The same applies with the stories of Jesus, including his resurrection. Through the testimonies having slight variations, the main objective was to express that Jesus is God, the Son of God, he died on a cross, and he rose again in three days. 
Guys, we're going to take a short break real quick. Give a shout out to our sponsor. Stay tuned for the second half of the Christian Apologist Podcast. Hey guys, thanks for staying tuned to the Christian Apologist Podcast. We're going to finish talking up about Christianity, why it is true, why Jesus' stories were true, why the evidence points to them being true, and why Christianity is the true and only religion. So American scholar and great skeptic Bart Ehrman wrote a book in 2005 titled Misquoting Jesus. His stance was that the New Testament documents cannot be historically proven to be accurate, so therefore they are not accurate and reliable. But within a year, one year or two, maybe, I think it was one year, but maybe two, a paperback version of the same book comes out, and on page 252 of that book, he says, Christian beliefs are not affected by textual variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. Testament. He is now openly admitting that the New Testament variants are not even enough to affect Christianity. The testimonies from the writers of the New Testament were also extremely, extremely embarrassing. Now, how's that? Well, in many places where the original 12 disciples were spoke about was in a very embarrassing manner. And here are some examples. John 12, 16, Mark 9, 32, and in Luke 18.34, all show how dingy the disciples actually were. Jesus says something to them or in front of them, and they have to ask Jesus what he meant by that when they were all alone. They didn't understand him. In Luke 26.33, Peter tries acting like a big shot with his chest all puffed out and in front of the other disciples and tells Jesus, even if everyone else falls away, I never will. But we all know what happens. He cowered down and denies Jesus when asked by women if he knew Jesus. In Mark 8.33, Jesus calls Peter Satan in front of everyone. Could you imagine how embarrassing that would be for Peter? He is the rock of Christianity, and he's kind of somewhat the leader of the other disciples. And yet, here is Jesus saying, you're Satan. You are God's greatest enemy. That is embarrassing. They would not have put that in there if it wasn't true. There's even embarrassing testimony about Jesus. Jesus had to be placed in a borrowed tomb. Here's Jesus. Think about this. Here's Jesus, the Son of God, and they are having to borrow a tomb to place his body in, according to Luke 23, 50 and 56. His disciples didn't even bother to try and give him a proper burial after he died. They didn't even bother to give him a proper burial, and they knew that he was the Lord of Lords. And in the same book of John in verse 20, they tell us how crowds, the crowds thought that Jesus was demon-possessed. The disciples claimed Jesus is the Messiah, in which they had abandoned their religion for, and now they're claiming that the others thought that he was a possessed human being. And now they're expecting us to believe that he truly was the Son of God? How would they expect us to believe that if they weren't just telling the truth? Now, that doesn't just make, it just doesn't make any sense of why they would do that. Why wouldn't they only tell us of the good things when they were talking about Jesus Christ? Why wouldn't they just tell us of all the good things people said or the good things that were done or the good things about themselves? I mean, they're trying to convince us of his, his divinity, aren't they? I mean, after Jesus' resurrection, the women told the disciples his body was missing and they had seen him. But yet the disciples didn't believe them and thought of it as nonsense. Even after Jesus said that he was going to come back after three days, the disciples did not believe even after the women said we had seen him. I mean, then you got to think about this. This is the best part to me. At the crucifixion, every single disciple abandoned Jesus. Every single one, every single one that had been with him and followed him, saw his miracles, saw what he did, they abandoned him at the crucifixion, except the women. The women were the ones who stood brave while the men got scared, tucked their tails, and ran. Now, that just doesn't make any sense unless it's true. No man is going to admit that they were a bunch of cowards and ran away from the Son of God being crucified instead of trying to help him and say that women were the ones that stood there till the very end. 
you know, and then he also got the story that Jesus' body was stolen from the tomb and, you know, to make people think that he had risen from the dead. Now, is that an actual possibility? Yes, it actually is a possibility, but it wouldn't be logical. Now, why is that? Because there is reasonable evidence pointing to this rumor not being true. For one, Jesus' body has never been discovered. Two, the testimony of the Roman soldiers who were meant to watch over the body to prevent theft would have most likely been killed for allowing it to happen. I mean, what are they going to say? Like, I think in one of the chapters, it talks about how the Roman soldiers had fell asleep. Could you imagine being a Roman soldier falling asleep after you just buried, you know, Jesus Christ who claimed to be the son of God and now his body is missing and you're saying he fell asleep? I don't think so. They would have killed them easily. The eyewitness account of the soldiers would never have been able to sustain the test of time if it wasn't true. Is it possible to prove that Christianity is false? Absolutely. You know, when I say that, a lot of people get shocked when I say that Christianity can be true. They expect me to be like, no, it can't be proven true. Actually, it can. And it'd be proven true very simply. All you got to do is just find the body of Jesus of Nazareth. If you find the body of Jesus, Christianity would be completely false. And honestly, we would be worshiping the wrong God. It's as simple as that. Christians around the world would have to come to realize that everything they believe in is false. But considering after 2,000 years they haven't found his body, and I personally know they never will because, well, we all know that he has risen and sitting at the right hand of God, then Christianity has to be, at the very least, plausible if you're considering God's. If they haven't found his body, and if you consider all the evidence, Christianity has to be, at very least, plausible. Now, what about the whole Trinity thing? And the Holy Trinity, honestly, is hard for anyone to actually understand. I mean, if someone claims they completely understand it, I'd seriously have to doubt they do. But the best way I've ever heard the Trinity explained was like this. Now, if you need to, get out a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen, and you're just going to have to draw this, and you'll see what I'm talking about. I want you to imagine there's a triangle. So draw a triangle. And in the center of that triangle, write divine nature. At the top of that triangle, you're going to write Father. He's divine nature. At the bottom left corner is the Son. That's his divine nature. But also, at the bottom left corner, you have to write human nature. Because Jesus had two natures. He had a divine nature and a human nature. And now in the bottom right corner, you can write down the Holy Spirit. So that's how the Trinity is best explained, I believe. So anytime you ask a question about Jesus, you actually have to ask two separate questions because you're dealing with two separate natures, his divine nature and his human nature. So for example, if I say, did Jesus get hungry? His human nature, yes. His divine nature, no. Does Jesus know when he's returning? His human nature, no. His divine nature, yes. Did Jesus ever get tired and want to go to sleep? His human nature, yes, but his divine nature, no. Now, I'm not saying that this makes complete sense and knowing the Trinity any less difficult, but maybe with that triangle, it can kind of help clear up a little less confusion you might have. But do you know how many people that claim to be atheist or agnostic have never even read the Bible? Over half, according to studies. Now, how can they claim to be the voice of reason and have never read the story of the most influential person to have ever walked. He is literally the central figure of the largest world religion. I don't care who you are, what your beliefs are, if you have no beliefs, or if you don't even want to believe that Jesus ever actually existed, but even though he did, you are doing yourself a big injustice by not at least reading the New Testament of the Bible. Why? Because either way you believe or don't believe, Jesus of Nazareth is unarguably the most influential person who has ever walked this planet. In 1926, Dr. James Allen wrote a sermon slash poem titled One Solitary Life. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard about it or not, or even read it, but I'm going to read it to you right now. Here, here's what it said exactly. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another vi- another obscure village, 
where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never went to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things usually associated with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen centuries have come and gone, and today Jesus is the central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliaments that have ever sat, all the kings that have ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of mankind on earth as powerfully as that one solitary life. Isn't that amazing? Thomas Aquinas sums it up best. He says, For those with faith, no evidence is necessary. For those with faith, no evidence is suffice. The entire Bible can be summed up by only one word. You know what that is? Redemption. The beginning of the Bible has paradise lost. The end of the Bible has paradise regained. And everything in between is God redeeming his people. So you can deny Jesus Christ. You can say there's not evidence, but there is. You can deny the evidence, but that's just your opinion. You can't get rid of the evidence that is there. That's like saying I can deny 9-11 ever happened, but it did. You can deny Jesus ever coming or being the Son of God, but he is and he was and he still is. If you follow the evidence to where it leads... If you're an atheist, you have to claim that you are the voice of reason. And to be the voice of reason, with all the evidence that points to it, you have to admit that it's at least possible that Christianity is true. And if it is at least possible, then you need to do some more research and digging and look into it. But when it boils down to it, guys, nobody is ever going to have the 100% burden of proof. All we have is evidence. We have history. We have historical text. We have the Bible. We have physical and archaeological evidence that points to that Jesus Christ was who he says he was. And you can have all the evidence in the world, but if you don't want to accept the evidence and follow it to where it leads, to Occam's Razor, then no evidence is ever going to lead you there. You all have the blessed rest of your week. Join us next Wednesday at 8.15 a.m. And y'all have a very, very blessed week.